Hello, virtual FOSDEM. My name is Jimmy Angelakos, and I work as a senior Postgres architect at EDB. And today we're going to talk about changing your uh, huge tables, data types in production. What is the motivation for this talk? First of all, we appear to be still in the era of big data whatever that means, which means that um, along with everything else, Postgres has been seeing uh, more heavy use with uh, bigger tables and bigger data sets. Also, Postgres performance has allowed this because it keeps getting better by the day. So you may find yourself in a situation where your database is uh, facing rapid growth and you need to find uh, a way to deal with that so perhaps your growth is too rapid and you need to mitigate uh, some decisions that you've taken early on so why would you want to change data types uh, on your database tables especially if they're in production First of all, you may have an incorrect data type, so something which was not suitable for what you wanted, like uh, you have set a limit for uh, varcar, which is not enough for your purposes, so you want to change it to variable length text. Secondly, you may want to change a non-optimal data type that you entered in your table. So, for example, an ID column that is text that takes up nine bytes for an integer column that stores this uh, ID uh, for only four bytes, which will help your table scale better. Also, you may come across the situation of running out of IDs if you have an integer ID column, uh, the maximum limit is 2.1 billion, a little bit over that. So you may come across uh, the situation of uh, ID exhaustion. And in that case, what do you do? How do you keep your application running? Of course, you know that you can change types. Uh, you can change types only if they are compatible though. So what you need is for data types that you, for the old data type to be binary coercible to the new type. So for example, uh, XML can be converted to text very easily without any conversion function uh, needed to be invoked. However, text to XML conversion requires a function to be run. So they are not binary coercible in that direction. And you can also have binary compatible columns uh, and data types that have exactly the same internal representation in Postgres, such as text and varcar. So the way you do it is you have the alter table alter type uh, statement. It's a DDL command that lets you alter uh, table alter the column name to type the data type you want. You may also need to use the using expression if there is no implicit cast between the first and the second type. Um, which needs that you may have to drop the default value for that column, uh, run the alter table statement, and then add another default uh, for the new data type. And this requires uh, indexes to be rebuilt, even if the table doesn't have to get rewritten. So what is the problem here exactly? Alter table alter column requires an access exclusive lock in order to change types. So that means that nothing can take place on that table. No reads and no writes are allowed to any other transaction. 
And this effectively stops us, stops us from using the table in production, which is a bad thing. Moreover, if the old data type and the new data type are not binary coercible between them, then you will have to rewrite the entire table, which is, of course, slow and requires double the disk space. So let us look at one possible scenario that you may encounter. Let's say that you have a huge table in production that is 1.7 billion rows. And you have a primary key, which is integer. So because of rapid growth, your table that is now 1.7 billion rows can become 2.1 billion rows very soon. So you find that big integer which doesn't have the 2.1 billion limit, but is much uh, larger, can be the solution for your problem. However, integer and bigint are not binary compatible because bigint is 8 bytes and integer is 4 bytes, so you have to rewrite the table. So how do you avoid having to lock the table in production and take everything down. So if you cannot take a maintenance window in order to perform this op lengthy operation, then you need a concurrent solution. And let's look at one possible concurrent solution that can work. So first off, we add a new big int column To the table, then we write a procedure that copies uh, values from the old primary key column to the new big int column, and we do it in batches so that we don't uh, affect the performance of the system too much. At the same time, we need to keep using the table and keep being able to write to the table. So we need to write a trigger that replicates the changes uh, in, from the old column, which your application is aware of, to the new column that is practically invisible to your application. After we have treated the entire table and we have copied everything from the uh, old column into the new big end column, we can drop the old column and rename the new one to the name of the old column. And then we make it the primary key. So let's look at a few details on what exactly needs to take place here. Uh, one detail is that we need to create a sequence for the new primary key. We also need to create the new primary key index. And after the conversion, we had best perform all of the DDL that does the column dropping and renaming in one transaction in order to be safe. And also keeping it in one transaction, Postgres tries to execute it as fast as possible. So we will encounter the minimum possible locking and or blocking of other operations by other users of our database. So the test system that was used to um, test this procedure was um, a laptop, basically. And we created a table with 1.7 billion rows of 170 bytes each. So let's see how we create this uh, example data. We create a table called large table with an integer column and a text content column. We create the table and we insert into the table our lorem ipsum to fill the, uh, to populate the uh, content column. And then we generate series uh, from one to uh, 
one billion seven hundred million as uh, we want uh, 1.7 billion rows in the table. Uh, the insert takes quite a bit of time. It takes uh, 32 minutes to generate this. It's not too bad because we haven't created any indexes yet. So we create a sequence uh, for our large table ID column, uh, starting at the very next number after uh, 1.7 billion. We set the default for the ID column to be this sequence. And then we create the index for the primary key. Uh, this takes 26 minutes on the test rig. So make of that what you will. And then uh, we need to add this unique index as the primary key constraints to the table. So alter table, large table, we add the primary key using the index we have just created. And that takes a very short time. So let's say that now our data is in production and uh, our table looks like this. It has a primary key and a sequence and an integer ID column. And we find that the size of our table is 265 gigs. So not small by any means. And our, the content of our table now looks like this. There's an ID from one to 1.7 billion and some content. If we select the number of live tuples, we can see from PG stat user tables uh, for a large table, we have 1.7 billion rows. First step is to add the new column. And if we make sure that the new column is has a default of zero, then that can be an instantaneous operation because it is non-volatile. So alter table, large table, add column ID underscore new. Big integer is what we want this time around. We want the column to be not null and we set a default of zero and that takes a very short time, like 13 milliseconds. Next, we need to build the trigger function to replicate the changes that are coming into our table while our conversion script is running that uh, copies everything from uh, the old ID column to the new ID column. So we create the function large table trigger function returns trigger. And the only thing it does is it, when uh, the value changes uh, in the table, we make sure that ID new takes the value of ID. So we create the function and then we need to add the trigger to the table that runs this function. So create trigger large table trigger before insert or update on large table because we want to replicate the changes to the new column for each row execute the function large table trigger function so now anything that changes in our table while we're running the conversion procedure is going to affect the new column as well the conversion procedure um, I'm sorry if the text is a bit cramped, but we'll look at it in detail. Um, we define a cursor for select ID from large table because we want to examine every single ID of that table. We define a batch size, so we're going to do it in batches of 100,000 rows at a time. So we begin a loop of updating our large table and setting uh, ID new equals ID for each one of the rows that we've selected. Uh, we increment our counter to um, determine where we are in the batch and every 100,000 uh, rows. So count modulo batch size equals zero. Uh, then we commit. 
So we don't commit with every row, we commit with every 100,000 rows for performance reasons. That ends the loop, and after we're done, we commit, and uh, the procedure is over. Now, what is important here is that we weren't able to do this with functions. So we are taking advantage of the fact that procedures in Postgres offer uh, us um, transactional control, and we can do things such as uh, begin transactions, commit them at will, roll back, and so on. So what if we want this huge task uh, to give us some progress indicator? So we can add in the loop if uh, count modulo batch size uh, multiplied by 10, then raise notice uh, rows done. So uh, it will tell us every million rows, 10 times uh, our batch of 100,000, that uh, the number of rows that have already been processed by the script. So now it's time to do it. We call the large table sync procedure and we see that it's processing 1 million rows, 2 million rows, 3 million rows, and so on. Now to check that our procedure isn't actually blocking anything and users are not prevented from using the table. Let's select something from our large table, uh, a random selection of one row, and we use the backslash watch command in PSQL to run it every second. So every second we get an ID from the table and another ID the next second and so on. So we keep it running and we see that because it runs, it means we're not blocking our users from uh, reading from the table. And also they're not prevented from writing to the table. So now we wait and seven hours later, we see that our procedure has completed. It is done processing 1.7 billion rows and it took seven hours and six seconds on the test rig, which is not too bad for something which is running concurrently. And remember the purpose of this procedure is not to run fast. It is not to overpower your system and affect your performance so negatively while you're doing it that nobody else is able to use your table. So what does our table look like now? Uh, it has an ID column, the content that it had, and an ID new column, which is identical, but is big integer instead of integer. Now we need to create the index for our primary key. So create unique index concurrently. Uh, we name it large table ID new index on our large table. And we create it on the new ID column that is begin. So index creation takes an hour and uh, 17 minutes. And now we're, we haven't really made any changes uh, to the table. So it, it's the time to run the DDL all at once, as we said. So we're going to use an anonymous code block to execute all of it. So we need to find the new start for our sequence. So we select the max ID from large table into the variable new start. Then we create a sequence and we concatenate new start to the end of that statement that we then execute. So create sequence large table uh, with that number. Then we alter table to set the sequence to be the default for our column ID new. And then we drop the ID column, rename ID new to ID, and then we add constraint, uh, the primary key, using the index we just created in the last step. We drop the trigger and we commit. At the moment we commit, all of the DDL is going to 
execute at the same time. And it shouldn't block the table for very long at all. And it shouldn't have any other negative consequences. So we run it and we see alter table add constraint using index is a warning that Postgres throws and says it will rename the index from large table ID new index to large table ID primary key, which is fine. And it does it and it only takes 451 milliseconds. So less than half a second on our test rig. And now we're all done. We have changed our huge table uh, primary key from integer to big integer without affecting the operation of our system. So thank you very much. And um, this is the background photo that was used. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and I am open to your questions now. Thanks very much for listening. All right. I assume that we are going to have uh, the broadcast in any moment. I'm just talking now to avoid this awkward silence. And <laughs> so we have a few questions. Thank you so lot, uh, Jimmy, for this specific uh, workaround. So you came with this idea probably from a life uh, existing issue, right? Can you tell us whether there was something you just wanted to study or, or this is a real problem that you face? Yeah, yeah, it's a real life problem. Um, people start using um, uh, primary keys with int and uh, it actually happens that sometimes they run out of integers because of the number of uh, transactions or uh, number of uh, customers that they add um, in their database. So it, it is a real world problem. Um, nice, no, not just a case study. So good. So uh, a question coming from the audience. Is it advisable to change a value in a column while changing the data type? So for instance, change the text to a boolean and set all empty fields to false. Sorry, I don't understand. The idea is that you change the data type, yeah? But you also change the values when you are doing that all at the same time. Oh, yeah, you can do that. Uh, if, you, if you set your conversion function to uh, change uh, everything and also the trigger, um, that uh, deals with the incoming values, uh, then sure, you can do that. Uh, whether it's something that you want to do, if you want a consistency in your application is a different story. Uh, because uh, as, as we said, this example is on a running live database. Uh, so uh, maybe your uh, application is not expecting the values to be changing. Right, yeah. And also because you're mentioning uh, it's a live database, so there are new integers that are coming in the primary key. There is a question uh, or a comment about the the sequence of the big integer that you're creating when you're changing, whether it's advisable or not to set it to a higher value so that you avoid any race conditions while doing the switch. Right, any yeah. So uh, in this case, uh, I uh, just selected the max integer and because uh, nobody was uh, writing into my table in my laptop, then it didn't change. But yeah, certainly it's a good idea to skip a few numbers ahead uh, when you're creating the sequence. Good, okay, thanks for clarifying that. There is another question here saying, how big the table became after you updated all the rows? Um, it grew, but not to twice its size. So it's a bit better than rewriting the entire table. And also if you have auto vacuum running, um, because you have multiple transactions, then it's able to clean up a bit better than doing it in one huge transaction. So any, any maintenance you have to do like, uh, after you do all this change, because probably you would like to do a vacuum full, but it's not possible, of course. And it's not a kind of a advice you just run back and forth in such a large table. But yeah, uh, it's probably a good idea to analyze after you've changed your data type. Analyze. Okay. Yeah, that's good for the statistics. I also see a question about um, 
uh, declaring the cursor withhold, you can't do that. Uh, that's an SQL uh, thing. If you declare the cursor um, in uh, PLPG SQL, you don't need to say withhold. Right, okay, yes. Thanks for clarifying that one as well. Okay, so I don't I don't see, see much questions uh, at the moment, but we already have a several ones, so that that's being good. Anything else that you would like to add from the presentation that you say like, oh, okay, I forgot to mention this that would have been valuable for the presentation? Uh, probably it doesn't. Uh, what I would like to have done if I had the time is uh, show a few more different data type conversions. So in this case, uh, we saw that it's uh, just a one for one copy of uh, uh, an integer into a big end uh, and it fits precisely. Um, but possibly there are other use cases. And if you're interested, then perhaps uh, I can have a follow up or add a few slides in my uh, presentation with uh, different use cases. Okay, excellent. And uh, more like a practical question, because this was not your database when you said that this was inspired by a real life uh, case, you needed to work together with, let's say, the customer that was uh, running it. How, 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 what do you have to do as, as a DBA to convince the developer or the project management in order to have this kind of maintenance uh, window that you need to have for all this change? Well, this didn't require a maintenance window. That's the whole point. Uh, so it was the only acceptable solution uh, in some cases. Uh, so um, when your management says that you cannot take the database offline because we'll be losing money, for example, uh, then it's the only thing you can do. You can only go for some concurrent solution. Yeah, okay. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. That's the, the value of this uh, specific workaround. So that's nice. Good. Um, Ila, do you have anything else to, to add? No, thank you. Thank you, Jimmy, for your talk. It was really interesting. Uh, um, we have three more minutes for questions, uh, and then this live will interrupt. So, yeah, if there are any questions, ask them now, or else uh, we can continue this conversation uh, in the room uh, of the talk, which will be available uh, in three minutes. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, Jimmy.